are going through a series called Table Conversations, and we've been looking at some of the ways that Jesus used the table to be able to teach people about the kingdom of God. Now, throughout the Gospel of Luke, this is a very prominent theme of Jesus' teaching. We see Jesus' teaching is often taking place either on the way to a meal, at a meal, or leaving a meal. And Jesus tends to use these meals as both the teaching tool and the place to tell people more about the kingdom of God. And today, we're going to get straight into it and look at, uh, at a very well-known meal that Jesus had with uh, a couple of ladies and some other people, which was in the house of Mary and Martha. So we'll get straight into it this morning. We're looking at Luke 10, 38 to 42. So if you have, have your Bibles, turn to Luke 10, 38 to 42. It'll also be up there on the screen. Very uh, quick passage. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. I love that phrase. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. There are four different key uh, characters or groups of people throughout this narrative, throughout these very uh, short few verses that we just read. There is Jesus, there is obviously Martha, the host of everything happening, there is Mary, the sister of Martha, And there is the crowd who is gathering there. Now, when we read through this story, it can be very, very easy for us to assume to assume that this is a small dinner party of people who are gathering together here with Jesus. But at this point, the 72 had just rejoined Jesus after their itinerant ministry tours. And considering Jesus' fame at this point, his visit would have undoubtedly attracted uh, a number of people. So it's fair to assume that this would have been a fairly large gathering that would have been happening at Martha's house at this point. I think it's fair to assume that there would have been a hundred people or more who would have been there for this gathering at Martha's house. Not only is Martha the host of this gathering taking place, but gatherings like this played a, a far more prominent place in their culture, in Jewish culture, than even for us today in our Western culture. Now, for myself, about a year ago, um, I invited a friend of mine uh, around my house, um, and this friend who has uh, some young children, uh, we decided to have a a night together of watching TV and just hanging out, Uh, and this was a real treat for him. But because this friend of mine was someone who I have known for uh, about 10 years or more, um, what I, I did for him is I gave him the real privilege of being able to sleep on our couch uh, throughout this night. Now, uh, although that was fine for me to be able to do to my friend uh, who I've known for such a long time, something like that, something some of you may have done for people who come round, this would have been unheard of in Jewish culture. It was a common practice of Jewish people to show a high level of hospitality uh, to every single person who came into their home. Not only was this a common Jewish practice that people took, uh, took part in, but it was considered a command of God to welcome people well, to provide for them well. This was a legal obligation within this society to show hospitality to strangers who asked for it. So for Martha to work hard and provide for everyone who is in her house, this is far more than just opening up for a a quick meal. And in this moment, you have Jesus who Martha recognised as the Messiah, coming into her house with all of his closest friends and she is given the opportunity to host and feed all of these people. 
Not only is Martha playing host to, uh, to Jesus, the promised Messiah, but she is also playing host to a hundred or more people who follow Jesus. And so the pressure here is on Martha at this point to impress everyone who is coming to her house. She needs to impress Jesus, but she also needs to impress everyone who is gathering here. And so she works hard. This gathering for Martha has everything to do with her reputation within Jewish culture at this time. This was a gathering that she would have thought could have been spoken about for years by people in the community. And because of this, Martha works hard. She spends all of her time cleaning and tidying and cooking to ensure that everything is right for the Messiah, Jesus, and the other people who have come to listen to him. And Martha is using every bit of her energy to provide for Jesus. I would compare what Martha is doing at this stage um, to one of us inviting an influential figure, a highly influential figure, to come around and have dinner at our house. So picture you were given the opportunity to host not just the King of England, but you were given the, ho- uh, the opportunity to host the entire, the entire royal family. Now, for those of you who might want us to become a republic, this may not be a big deal to you, but for many of you, if you had the opportunity to invite the, uh, the royal family around, there would be a lot that you would be doing to make sure that that event went perfectly. You would buy new kitchenware. You would cook the best food. You would clean everything until it was absolutely spotless, and this is what Martha is doing for Jesus and, uh, and the people who are joining with him. And then you have Mary. Mary, the sister of Martha. And instead of Mary helping out Jesus with all of the preparations, Mary chooses to sit there. She joins with all of the crowd and she learns from Jesus. She's relaxing hearing from the Messiah, who is teaching all of these wonderful things. Now, it's easy for us here 2,000 years ago to look back on this event with hindsight and think, Martha, you have Jesus there. Surely you would sit at his feet and you would listen to him, stop racing around and spend some time with him. But you have Martha, who is Uh, While Jesus is there, she's slaving away in the kitchen, she's making sure the decorations are nice, she's making sure everything's clean and tidy, she's keeping the drinks filled and the food done, and all of that time, Mary, Martha's sister, is relaxing, listening to Jesus talk. Now, I really want to stress this point, that there is not just Jesus there in a small party, but there are probably over a hundred people at this gathering, all listening to Jesus speak. So there is a lot to be done. There is a huge amount of pressure on Martha for this event to be pulled off and to provide for all of them, which is exactly what Martha is trying to do. Now, before we get any further, I just need to clarify something about the way that I personally read this passage. When I initially read this passage... I don't like Mary very much. Jesus here is speaking to a vast amount of guests and there is so much that needs to be done. And yet Mary, Martha's sister, is spending all of her time relaxing. And I think Martha's response is fairly reasonable. If I was in Jesus' shoes responding to Martha... I would have been thinking that Jesus would say, hey Mary, maybe just head into the kitchen for about five minutes, give your sister a hand, and I'll keep teaching along the way. But that's not Jesus' response. Rather, Jesus, in a very kind and considerate way, he essentially tells Martha that she's worrying about the wrong things and that Martha has missed the point of what's going on in front of her. Now, I've always thought we don't really see Martha's response after Jesus says this, but I've wondered what Martha feels like at this point. Does she take on what Jesus says? 
Does she get frustrated at Jesus? That probably would have been my response. Does she throw up her hands and decide, fine, you guys prepare it, you guys run this, uh, this event right now. Now, I empathise with Martha because I feel like her and I are very similar personalities. Um, now, there's a, a personality typing uh, tool which is called the Enneagram and there's something called Type 1s who are the perfectionists. And perfectionists are said to be, and I quote, conscientious and ethical with a strong sense of right and wrong. They are teachers, crusaders, and advocates for change. They're always striving to improve things, but afraid of making a mistake. They're well-organized, orderly, and fastidious. They try to maintain high standards, but can slip into being critical and perfectionistic. They typically have problems with resentment and impatience. Now, when I read that list of characteristics, I think everyone should be like that. Doesn't everyone think in that way? I feel like that's Martha. She is the perfectionistic type one like me. She wants things in this gathering to be organised, running smoothly. She wants to have high standards displayed for the Messiah and all of those who have gathered into his house. And yet, somehow, it seems like she is doing the wrong thing. All the while, you have Mary, who is not doing a thing to help or make things better. Now, I've heard sermons on this meal that we've just read about, and some of the sermons I've heard can imply that this passage is saying that Jesus' expectation for all of his followers is that they should spend the priority of their time simply sitting at Jesus' feet, hearing his words, reading from the Word of God, and ensuring that you're not too busy for Jesus. This should be the majority and priority of your time. If that's true, though, if we are simply to spend time only listening to Jesus and ensuring that we're not too busy for Jesus, then every single one of us should become a monk. We could start the Brackenridge Baptist monkery together. (laughs) But from what I can see, I don't think that's Jesus' heart, particularly when we look at uh, at the rest of the New Testament. This never seems to be the goal of Jesus or the rest of the disciples. Now, depending on your outlook, you might have issue with different people, uh, different members of the key people throughout this narrative. And there are some common outlooks that contribute to how you might read what Jesus uh, says here. Essentially, uh, all of us can fall into uh, two different camps, uh, but most of us will fall somewhere on this spectrum. We can either think it's great to be uh, not too busy for Jesus, or we can think, uh, really, we should just be working hard for Jesus. We all have this natural inclination, which is either to do too much or to do too little. And the people on the do too much end of the spectrum, they view the don't be too busy people as the lazy layabouts. The people on the do-too-little end of the spectrum view the opposite as the stressed-out workaholics. Now, there have been Bible teachers who seemingly come across like they are teaching one of these different ways. Um, Some very well-known Bible teachers have taught things that seemingly uh, communicate this. Um, A guy called, a very well-known teacher called Dallas Willard said, hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. There is nothing else. Ronald Rollheiser says, we live in a culture of excessive haste, of pathological busyness. C.S. Lewis, the very well-known C.S. Lewis, said to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. And a guy called John Mark Comer wrote a whole book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. 
Now, based on this and the credibility of these people that I have just mentioned, it seems like we should lean towards the don't be too busy for Jesus. Maybe we should all be lazy layabouts for Jesus. Is that what he wants? But then on the other end of the spectrum, you have other people who teach what is seemingly uh, the attitude of working hard for Jesus. So a very well-known uh, quote from someone called uh, Ken Blanchard is, don't retire, refire. I mean, Jesus himself, he worked on the Sabbath, even in moments when he was tired, he still chose to heal people who were in need during the Sabbath. It, uh, Paul, throughout a lot of his teachings, he encourages those who are reading uh, his letters to work hard. I particularly think of Second Timothy, uh, Paul encourages Timothy to work hard for Jesus. And so where should we fall on this spectrum? Was Jesus teaching here with Mary and Martha that we should veer towards the end where we should not be, where we should not be too busy or we should not work too hard for Jesus? Now, when we look at this story uh, with Jesus, with Martha and Mary, it can be easy for us to place Martha in the work hard for Jesus category and Mary in the <coughs> don't be too busy for Jesus category, but I don't think that's what's going on here at all. Jesus is at no stage encouraging Mary to not work hard for him, this information on its own, what you're looking at there on the screen, it makes us think that there is a spectrum, but what if it doesn't have to be one or the other? What if instead, as Christians, we don't be too busy for Jesus, but we work hard for Jesus? What if as Christians, we work hard for Jesus, but don't be too busy for Jesus? Life doesn't need to be lived on this spectrum of working and striving harder for Jesus and then trying to manage that, nor does it need to be spent avoiding becoming too, uh, working too hard whilst ensuring you're living your life well. It is possible to work hard for Jesus and not become so distracted by that, that we become too busy for Jesus uh, when He is speaking to us. And the way that we are able to do both of these things comes back to our heart. It's not our actions, it's our heart, which is what Jesus is speaking to here when He speaks to Martha. And the key question that we need to answer when we're assessing our heart is, who are you really serving? Jesus' response to Martha is not just to quiet down and rest, but Jesus chooses to address the motive that is driving Martha as she is preparing all of these things. Because in verse 41, Jesus says to Martha, you are worried, this is what's going on inside Martha, you are worried and you are upset about many things. Martha might be trying to serve Jesus, but she's also spending all of her time preoccupied with this massive crowd that is there as well. Mary, on the other hand, knows that serving the crowd doesn't matter when you have Jesus in your midst. And the way that Jesus wants His people to serve Him primarily is to listen to Him when He's speaking. That is the most important way that we are able to serve Jesus, the Messiah. When Jesus speaks, and He is speaking all of the time, the only thing that we should be doing in that moment is stopping to listen and spend time with Him. This doesn't mean that we stop and don't work hard for Jesus. It means two things. It means when Jesus is speaking, we stop and listen, but also we create space in our lives to stop and listen. Over the past four weeks, Sarah, my wife and I, have been adjusting uh, to a new season of, of life. Um, now, I have been, I've always been a high routine person, um, and... <laughs> judging by my perfectionistic type of personality. And I have been 
really wanting to have some sense of routine in my life. This has been affected, unfortunately. <laughs> we have managed to get some sense of routine. I have pushed for this. Um, now, the way that we have made this uh, begin anyway, is when Zech wakes up, Zechariah, our little boy, when he wakes up at different times uh, through the night, Sarah goes and uh, feeds Zech, puts him down and goes to bed, but from 4.30 a.m., that's my shift, okay? We take this in shift. So from 4.30 a.m., it's my shift, and my shift in the morning is to do a few different things. It's my job to make sure the house is ready, all of the house jobs are done, and that we're good to go for the day. Unfortunately, Zek hasn't gotten the memo that this is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> this routine was working for a little while. I was able to hop up out of bed, do all of the house jobs, and the moment I finished, that's when Zek needed me. But Zek, this past week, has decided to change things. And three times this week, it took me three hours to do some basic house jobs because Zek decided that he would cry and want to be held. On one of these occasions, as I had all of these things I needed to get done, um, and as I was holding Zek as, I was, as he was settling, I was starting to get pretty frustrated. I was being a bit of a Martha. We had three lots of people coming around on this certain day, and Zek seemed to just cry as soon as I put him down. There was no reason that he cried, he just simply wanted to be held. Now, as I thought about all of these multiple things that I needed to do to get ready for all of these people throughout the day, I had a moment. I realized the opportunity that I was missing. I had my son in my arms, who was just wanting to be held. And all I could think of was how I could serve these other people who were coming around later in the day. And my mind came back to this passage. And I felt God was saying to me, Dave, Dave, you're upset and worried about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Choose what is better, and it will not be taken away from you. As my mind came back to this passage, I felt God was not just teaching me, trying to teach me a lesson about my son, but I felt that God was trying to teach me primarily about my relationship with Him. It made me realize that this is what Jesus is talking about. In the same way that Zek just wanted my attention for a little while and for me to not serve everyone else who was coming around that day, I feel like this is what God is wanting from us. When Jesus is speaking to us, He is wanting us to stop give our undivided attention to Him. And we do this when He speaks, we stop and listen, but we also need to create space in our lives to stop and listen. The only way that you can do this is by truly analysing your own heart. What are the motives of your heart? Who are you really wanting to serve? Who are you wanting to impress? Are you wanting to impress the crowd? Are you wanting to serve Jesus? Because the most important way that we can serve Jesus is through listening to Him. This morning, as the music team just comes up right now and as we uh, prepare to, to sing, I just want to give you the opportunity to, uh, to listen. Um, so I'm just going to invite you to just remain seated during this time um, as we just sing this, uh, this next song and then we'll stand for the, uh, uh, for the final song. And I just want to give you that opportunity to analyse your own hearts. Who are you serving? Are you wanting in your life to serve Jesus primarily? Or is it more about the crowd? Is it more about other people? Now, as I say all of this, 
this is not an excuse for us to not work hard for Jesus. So many points throughout the New Testament we see the example of people like Paul, Peter, the rest of the disciples, and they work hard for Jesus. We should do that. And that should never come at the cost, though, of us listening to the prompting of Jesus when he is wanting to speak to us. It should never come at the cost of us creating space for Jesus within our life. Let me pray for us. Thank you, Jesus, for the example of Mary. This lady that we know very, very little about from this story, but we know that she just had a heart that wanted to stop and listen to you. God, I just really pray for any of my brothers and sisters here this morning who are so consumed by working hard for you and they don't create space to listen to you. God, would you just... Uh, I guess, convict their hearts right now. (laughs) For any of us, God, who are not creating space for you, we want to, to change that. We want to hear your still, small voice as you speak to us. Because we know, God, that you are always speaking. You're always speaking to us. And even right now, in this moment, just as we sit and as we listen to the words of this song, I ask that you will speak to us. If any of us are spending more of our energy and time and and passion in serving the crowd, God, would you just convict our hearts? Would you show us that the most important thing is serving you, Jesus? God, we want to serve you with all the gifts that you have given us, but we also want to serve you with our time and our undivided attention. We want to listen to you when you speak. So would you speak to us even right now in Jesus' name, amen.